How's everybody doing? Oh, come on. There's more enthusiasm. How are you guys doing this morning? All right. I thought earlier today uh, is the uh, Super Bowl of churches. It's our day of celebration, although sometimes we don't act like it. It is our day of celebration. Amen? All right. This morning, I'm going to bring a message titled, The Little. Uh, Pastor Lena spoke a message a couple weeks ago called, One Thing. This week, I'm going to follow it up with, The Little. So I have a question for you. Have you recognized that throughout Scripture, have you seen this pattern, have you noticed this concept that God can take a little and do a lot? He can take a little and do a lot. See, this theme runs all throughout Scripture. It's a concept that if you pay attention, you begin to notice because it was one man, Abraham, who became the father of many nations. Moses, who led the people out of Egypt. It was Joshua, who led them into the promised land. And ultimately, one man, Jesus, who changed the course of history. There's a word for that, and we're going to talk about it today, and that word is remnant. Remnant. What is a remnant? Well, a remnant is a small remaining quantity of something. A remnant is what remains, what's left over from a larger portion. Now, when we built this uh, sanctuary out, uh, it had never been built out before, so we were the first tenants to move in. So we actually furnished, or there was someone who donated tile to us, so our entire kitchen is actually from remnants. It's left over from a previous job. You can see the carpeting. We have floor tiles, and we have boxes of remnants in our storage because it's left over from the larger portion. So you may think of a remnant, a fabric of remnant. Uh, there are stones of remnant that are used for uh, countertops. Usually you'll find those in the discounted portion of the store. Why? Because remnants aren't seen as that special. They're seen as less desirable, therefore not valuable or worth much. See, remnants don't look impressive, have little usage, and remnants are often what's discarded after it, something is completed. But the remnant principle in Scripture is that God can use a little and do a lot. See, the kingdom operates differently. It flips the world upside down. What is foolish to them is wisdom to us. Amen? So the rem remnant principle is God can use a little and do a lot. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. The New Testament tells us in Romans 11, 15, even so, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Let's clear something up. We are, you are the remnant. Those called by grace who recognize that Jesus came to us, died for our sins, was resurrected, and because of what Jesus did for us, we will spend eternity with him. We are the remnant. And God is moving on the earth this day. It's no wonder to me, it's no coincidence that Revival is breaking out in little spots of earth. He is gathering the remnant unto himself. We are the remnant. In the book of John, sorry, not the book of John, John wrote in the book of Revelation, he wrote to, to one of the seven churches, and in Revelation 3-2 he said this, Be constantly alert and strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen that which remains. You know, Pastor Lena, in her message uh, that I said, you know, it was one thing, it was a couple weeks ago, and she was really getting to the point was, what was that one thing God was asking us to do? What is it to yield? Is it that one sin we need to repent of? Is that one thing we need to step out in faith of? What is that one thing that God is asking or requiring us to do? And so often when we decide to yield to that one thing, so many more areas of freedom can come. The one thing unlocks the, the next thing. So in her, her sermon, she was giving an example of her one thing when she went to the gym and she asked her first ever trainer, and her, her trainer asked her to do a squat. Now, when she began to tell this story, I thought, I have a similar story in the gym. 
It doesn't surprise me. She's, they're my spiritual parents, so I would, of, of course, have a story. So I thought, I have a one thing story in the gym, too. So growing up, um, I was not an athlete. I know, I know it looks like I was. I, I, get, I get it. But I was a choir kid. So I grew up, I grew up singing. I was working out my vocal cords. So I, uh, you know, in my, uh, my 20s, I decide it's time to work out. Uh, so I in, in, in enroll in a gym. I go, you know how they do a, a, an evaluation? Uh, really, it's just a gimmick so they can sign you up for personal training. But anyway, so I go there. He's evaluating me. He's gone over a few things, and I believe it was one of the first things he asked me. And so he gets out a straight bar, and he puts on you know, some weight on you know, each side. And he uh, hands it to me, and I'm thinking, okay, what's this for? And so then he, he, he says, okay, put that on your back. And he goes, do a lunge. And I'm like, Okay. So I have the weight on my back, and I start to, but it's obvious from the get-go, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking, and he's like, oh, okay, 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 let's, let it, let's take off some weight. So he takes off a little bit of the weight, and he goes, okay, now do a lunge. So then I stand, and I'm shaking, and he goes, whoa, 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 okay, okay, let's just do the bar. So I'm like, okay. So then I attempt to the, to the bar and almost do it. He goes, forget it, just pretend you have a bar. That's how bad it was. See, the point is, he wasn't looking for what I was strong in. He was looking for my area of weakness. See, he didn't want to strengthen or, or make stronger the areas I was already strong in. See, I had developed strength in certain areas. He was looking for the areas that later could prove to be vulnerable. See, we often think that when God points out our vulnerabilities or he points out a weakness in us it's because he's a bully and he thinks that we're, we're no good the truth is he wants to prevent you from future failure strengthen what remains see the remnant is what remains i want to look at just a couple passages of scripture i'm going to draw out of those things uh just a couple stories of the little things to to get that when we leave this place today it's the little things that make the difference so in the book of 1 Kings 17, 1 Kings 17, Elijah has just prophesied that a severe drought and famine was coming. Why? Well, because of the sins, wickedness, and idol worship that was being committed by King Ahab, Queen Jezebel, and the Israelites. See, the people had essentially rejected God. But during this time of famine, see, he still provided. So God is providing for Elijah by leading him to places of resource. So here in 1 Kings 17, God has instructed Elijah to go to a widow. He says, there she will provide for you. So let's look at 1 Kings 17, chapter 10 through 12. 1 Kings 17, 10 through 12. Today we're going to go through quite a bit of, of uh, Scripture, but I want you guys to see it so you can get it. Are we there? 1 Kings 17, 10 and 12. I know the screen is there. Do you, are you there on your Bibles, those that have the Bible, the analog version? All right, verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the entrance of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a cup so that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. She replies, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. But Elijah instructs her that if she does this, that God will make sure her supply doesn't run out. Verse 15 says this, so she went and did everything in accordance with the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. She went and she did. Most of the times we went and we don't. Did you get that? She went and did. I know it's not proper grammar. She went and did, but often, so often, we went and and don't. We hear the word, but don't obey it. We hear the command of God and don't obey it. See, if she what would the outcome have been 
if she would have chosen to not submit to what the Lord had said. But she, in obedience to God, believed the word of Elijah, and because of the believing, she were sustained, her and her family. So she went and did. Can we be a people that went and did? Come on, can we be a people who went and did what God said to do? Uh, There's tons of times in my life where I've heard God, but did I do it? The answer is no. I'm not a fool to stand up here and say that every time I've heard God say something, I've done it. But see, we need to practice the art of obedience and yielding. Can we just yield to his way and not it be our way all the time? And so we need to win and did, not win and don't. So the widow gathers the little ingredients she has. It's literally all that remained, a remnant. See, she didn't realize that by her act of obedience and what little remains and what little she had was about to bring her from death to life. She's about to die, but because she obeyed God, she went from apparent death to life. Are you guys with me this morning? From death to life. See, in God's economy, a handful and a little can sustain you. See, when all you have is a little, but what little you do have, you offer to God. He will take your obedience. He will bless it. He will multiply it. And he will sustain you. I want to look at when Jesus fed the 5,000. I'm going to be reading out of Mark chapter 6, verse 33 through 38. Feeding the 5,000, Mark chapter 6, verse 33 through 38. We'll start. The people saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there together on foot from all the cities, and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I may remember me preaching Psalms 23 a few weeks ago. And he began to teach them with many things. And when it was already late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is secluded, and it's already late. Basically, they were saying, Jesus, you've been teaching a long time. We are tired. We are hungry. Where can we go? So, so his disciples came up to him, probably because the people were complaining, and, and said, this place is secluded, and it is already late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go? And spend 200 denarii on bread and give it to them to eat. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. I want you to notice what what the disciples are saying there. Send them away so that they may purchase. That they may purchase for themselves something to eat. But Jesus responds because he's getting ready, everything's pointing to the cross, that no, there is a price to pay, but you nor them can purchase this. I am the purchase price. He is the purchase price. I want to do just a little background to this. John 6, 9-13 says this. This is a little bit of the, of, of, of the context around what I just read. Verse 9-13, through 13, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, have the people recline to eat. Now there was plenty of grass in the place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were reclining. Likewise, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing will be lost. Verse 13, so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with pieces from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. You remember my last sermon, the shepherd's call that I just mentioned? It was out of Psalms 23. And note what we just read. He calls them to recline first. What does Psalms 23 say? I will, I will cause them to lie down in green pastures. And then he fed them. I also learned that that's just a part of Passover is you must recline to eat. So this is at the time of Passover, so that's what's going on here. See, Jesus provided extravagantly from a remnant. Five loaves, two fish. See, out of little, or what remained, he stewarded great abundance. 
See, if he can trust you in the little, then he can trust you to handle in abundance. Luke 16.10 says this, The one who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And the one on the opposite side, the one who is unrighteous in a very little thing, is also unrighteous in much. But Jesus says, bring them here to me. When you bring Jesus the little, the seemingly small portion or the pieces you have, nothing is impossible with God. See, I for one can identify, I never thought I had enough to bring to God. I thought I was too broken. I didn't think I had enough. I would look around and I would see the amazing people who were gifted, talented, could preach like no other. I always compared myself to others. I never thought I would measure up. See, I didn't think I had enough to offer God. I was riddled with shame and guilt, condemnation. See, I felt I was too broken for him to do anything with. And finally, when I saw that if I offered him all that I am, he will take it and multiply it. See, he takes the willing and makes them able. Come on, he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. And I'm okay with being foolish. See, he wants to bring us to a place of wholeness. See, the world, the naysayers, the scoffs, the critics, the religious, that's preposterous. What what are you going to do with that little, a few pieces of bread and a couple of fish? That little bit, that's not going to provide for anyone. It will do nothing. How are you going to feed all those people? How are you going to reach that many people? How is Little Epicenter Church going to impact Fort Bend County with a revival? Because we're going to offer with what little we have unto him, and he will bless it and he will multiply it. Come on, he will bless it and he will multiply it. See, you're not delusional in this place. The world says that you're delusional. The world says that you're just a remnant. But, the, but God calls the remnant his, and he will raise you and elevate you to a place if we just yield our lives to him. Jesus said to them, bring me the remnant. When you're a part of the remnant, it's not an easy place to be. You're largely rejected, face persecution, and deemed unnecessary, worthy of being thrown in the garbage. Remnants are normally discounted, but God doesn't discount us. When we offer what we have, even in the little, just offer it to him faith is a marker of the remnant Matthew 17 20 says this he said unto them because of your meager faith because of your little faith for truly I say to you if you have faith the size of a mustard seed you will say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I'm a bit of a farmer myself. Lately, I've been sprouting broccoli sprouts. And I joke that they're my children because you have to wash them twice a day. You have to make sure they don't dry up. And so I've been doing this the last couple months. And so this morning, I brought a broccoli seed. Now, you probably can't see it, and that's the point. You don't see faith. You see the fruit of faith. See, I, I looked this up. A broccoli seed is very close in size to a mustard seed. So can you imagine God says, this is the amount of faith you need, and nothing shall be impossible for you. You want tips on broccoli sprouting? You ask me after service. I'm real good at it now. Another marker of the remnant is there is no compromise. First Kings 19.18 says this. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. That yet I will leave means be left over to remain. There was a remnant that Elijah thought he was the only one left, but God said, look out, I've got 7,000 people who have not compromised their life. You are not alone. 
There's a lot of times when we feel like we're the only ones pressing in. We're the only ones that's, that's vying for revival. And there is a world of people who are crying out, come Lord Jesus and save this nation. There is an attack on this generation like no other. There is an attack on this generation like no other. The, the enemy wants to pervert their minds and tell them who they're not. They want to confuse them. Conf- they, 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 there is no way that if you don't know who you are, you can begin to even accomplish what God has wanted for your life. So you've got Got to, to we God has got to move on this generation because the enemy wants some soldiers too, but we know the kingdom is at hand. See, there's an undercurrent and a pressure and a growing temptation in our day to not be so radical. Don't be so passionate. Don't take the written word as the infallible word of God. Just calm down. Just calm down. Don't, don't be so passionate. Why do you have to be so loud? Why do you have to pray so long? Why do you have to go to so many services? Why isn't your service just an hour like the other churches? Why do you have to go two hours? Just calm down. See, why does your pursuit of the Lord have to be so intense? Why you got to be so intense? See, there's a growing movement inside church buildings. Notice, church buildings, not inside the church. The true church will never compromise. But inside church buildings, there's a movement to tolerate sin and to accept every interpretation of Scripture under the sun as your truth. It's not your truth, it's His truth. See, there's a very real agenda, just as in the days of Elijah, that a spirit wants to silence, shut down the voice and movement of the Lord. See, what we're told is that the word we preach is hate speech and misinformation. And Jesus is the prime example of cancel culture. They hated his message so much, they crucified him for it. And that was the church at the time, the religious leaders. So I want to look at a little story inside of a bigger story. And it's out of Matthew 27, 15 through 26. I am praying that my eyes can read this small print in my Bible from here. Ready? Ready? All right. Now at the feast, the governor was was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. And at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together... Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas? Barabbas? He's like pushing Barabbas forward. Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of the envy that they had handed him over. Verse 19. While he was sitting on the, judge, on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing, this is speaking of Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas. For Barabbas. And to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they cried out, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify him. It's just a little story inside of a greater story of the passion, what we call the passion. I grew up in Arkansas, and there was a small town, and now I can't remember the name of the, something Springs, Eureka Springs, that was it. Eureka Springs, that was called the Passion Play. And they would do the, the, the story of Jesus on his way to the cross. And so there's just a little story that most of us overlook about Barabbas. See, Barabbas was a thief, an insurrectionist, a murderer. He was serving on death row for his crimes that he had committed against the government. Barabbas was not a stranger to this life. Matthew, in fact, calls him a notorious prisoner. He's a repeat offender. He's a repeat offender. Let me get that right. See, Barabbas was not a stranger. He was well known for the trouble that he caused. Two men, Jesus and Barabbas, one deserving punishment according to the law and the other totally innocent of the faces he charged. 
So there was a custom at Passover and that the Jews would choose one prisoner to be set free. Pilate inquires of them, who do you want me to set free? Pilate is hoping, hoping that it would be Jesus. Because he knew that Jesus had done nothing deserving of death, but the people still insisted Barabbas. See, one man goes free, undeserving of the pardon, and one man pays the price for the other sins. The gift, the grace, and mercy of God allowed this man to walk out of prison free. Does that sound like anybody in here? We are Barabbas. He didn't earn it. He's done nothing to deserve it, but God took his place willingly. Jesus took his place. At any moment, Jesus could have set himself free. But they said, Barabbas or Jesus? They said, give us Barabbas. And Jesus took his place on the cross. Barabbas, picture this, walks out free. His hands unshackled. His feet unfettered. And he walks out of that prison a free man. Is anyone picking up what I'm laying down? We don't know if Barabbas was even grateful, but Jesus did it anyway. The love of the Father spared the life of Barabbas. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, yet Christ died for us. Yet, while we were still Barabbas, he died for us. Sinful, full of guilt and shame. Yet he chose to go on the cross for us. Christ died for us. Matthew 17, 20. I want to go back to that verse. Matthew 17, 20. And he said to them, because of your meager faith. So he says, because of your little faith. The only time God discourages the little is in faith. Jesus said to them so many times, you of little faith. See, he chastised them for having little faith. But earlier, didn't he say, if you have the grain of a broccoli seed, a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed, cast into the seed. Didn't he just say that? Well, see, there's a difference in having little faith, but all the faith you have fills this seed as opposed to having a larger seed and only half of the seed being filled with faith. It's all about the portion. One, I'm fully persuaded, even in the little, and one, I'm somewhat persuaded. Picture this, because I love coffee. You're going to order a latte, okay? Think of the best latte you, you have. Think, think of ordering it, okay? If you don't like coffee, think of tea. If you don't like that, think of a meal you had. You're going to place an order, okay? So you, you make the order. You notice the barista begins to, to make your coffee. You begin to pour it. You look, and you notice that the, that the barista has somewhat looks confused because they've not filled up the cup all the way. And it's like three-fourths full, and I'm thinking... Well, I paid for a full cup of coffee. Where's my, my coffee? And so they so here's your order. And I'm like, that's not my order. I mean, it's my order, but it's not what I paid for. I paid for a full cup. See, that's what the difference is. One, our faith fills the cup. One, our faith doesn't barely fill the cup at all. See, the difference is if I'm full of faith, that faith will take me to new levels. But if I doubt in my faith, I can't accomplish much. Faith is the currency of heaven. So you just got to fill the cup. Your faith needs to be at capacity. This is a tiny measure of faith. But if you fill this, there is nothing that is impossible for you with God. Nothing. The little things. The little things. Just a little bit of faith goes a long way. So I'm going to end with this. John chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. And when they had eaten their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with pieces from the five barley. When does five equal 12? I don't know. It's God's math. So they filled up the 12 baskets just from five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. See, the enemy will tell you that what you have isn't enough. It's too small. You're too broken. It's just pieces. It's not enough to do anything. It's not enough to make a change. There's no value in what you have. There's no value in what you offer. 
you are just a remnant of what someone else could do. But he says, gather it all up and bring it to me so that nothing is lost. He doesn't want a single thing lost in our lives. And he will make sure, too, that nothing is lost when we simply bring it to him and we offer up what little we have. He will take it, he will bless it, and he will multiply it. He wants no thing lost in any of our lives. No matter the broken things or the seemingly fragments, he can take the leftover, the little things, the remnants, and bring about healing and freedom in our lives. But we must gather ourselves and bring our remnants to him. Amen? You guys stand up. Let's pray before we dismiss. Father, we thank you for your word. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that those in this room who feel like they have nothing to offer, God, I thank you, Lord, that if we just offer all that we have, what little we have, God, in comparison to you, who are we, God? But God, you ask us to come to you, God, and so what we do is we lay bare forth all that we have, God, and we just say, use our lives, God. What's in our hands, God, we offer. We don't keep it for ourselves, God. We don't we no longer think that what we have isn't enough or it's not good enough or we're too broken. I thank you, God, that you paid the price for our healing. Father, on this day of resurrection that we, that we celebrate, God, we thank you for the little things in our lives that you have turned around and that the things you continue to turn around, God. I thank you, Lord, that faith will fill our cups, God. God, we honor you today. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that was paid. Lord, we thank you for the victory that you rose from the dead. And God, I thank you, God, that you are healing the nations. And so I thank you, Lord, for the remnant, even in this room, God. May it grow even stronger. May we strengthen that which remains. In Jesus' name I pray. And I say amen.